Good morning. Thank you for your patience. This is Alana Mueller with Kaufman Fast Track. Welcome, everyone. We're thrilled to have you. Um, this morning, our speaker has been unfortunately delayed. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I have a few announcements, and we can start to talk through some of the principles of the St. Bernard Principle, Why Specialists are the Alpha Dogs in Business by Paul Welsh. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I wanted to let you know that our next author series event will be on Wednesday, May 22nd. There we will welcome Bob Hisrich, who is a professor of entrepreneurship at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. He is also the author of Corporate Entrepreneurship, How to Create a Thriving Entrepreneurial Spirit Throughout Your Company. Now, many of us have talked from time to time about what I call intrapreneurship, sort of the spirit of entrepreneurship within an existing uh, organization, typically a large organization. And that's one of the things that Bob will address. He'll talk a little bit about why and how innovation is so important. I also want to announce to you that for those of you who are here in our hometown of Kansas City, we are going to have the second in our series of what we call the Connect At events. These are networking events that we are scheduling on a, about a quarterly basis. Uh, last, last time we had one at a place called uh, Coffee Girls, which is a local fast track uh, alumna who owns a little coffee shop. Uh, it was so much fun that we decided to have a whole series. So this month, tomorrow on Thursday, April 11th, we're having an event called Connect at Cookie Doodle. It's from 4 to 6 p.m. at Cookie Doodle Crafts in Old Overland Park. And what's interesting about Cookie Doodle is that it was started by a mother-daughter team who together took our Fast Track for the Female Entrepreneur course last year. And their idea was to start a craft, uh, a craft store for children uh, to come in with their families, to come in and to make projects. It's been very successful. And following the Fast Track New Venture course that Sheila and Katie Weiford took, they went ahead and started this business. So we're thrilled to, to be partnering with them for this Connect Ad event. Additionally, another uh, Fast Track for the Female Entrepreneur, uh, this time on the Growth Venture track, uh, Jay Monroe, owns a company called Embrace the Grape that she grew as a result of her experience with Fast Track Growth Venture. Uh, it is a beverage catering company, and so Jane will be there to serve some of her wine uh, at the event. So I hope, again, for those of you in the Kansas City area that you'll join us. Again, it's from 4 to 6 p.m. tomorrow night. And for those of you in other cities, we know that several of our affiliates are considering hosting similar events uh, in their local areas. So I hope that you'll participate in those events uh, as they become available. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Michelle Markey, and in Paul's absence, we hope that he will still be able to join us. It appears that he's had some car trouble this morning. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the principles associated with the St. Bernard Principle and think a little bit about how it can be useful to you. Yeah, so this is Michelle, and thank you for joining us. As normal, when we have these sorts of webcasts, if you have questions and are interested in um, typing them in, we try and monitor them actually pretty closely. So um, uh, from this angle, we'll answer questions kind of as we go. So I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read or at least take a, a brief search through the St. Bernard Principle, but... The, the overarching message, as you can see here in the in the tagline of the of the uh, top of the of the title, I should say, is that really specialization is is really to your advantage. And so, in our business world, what we know is that the more specialized that we can can make ourselves, the more we can set ourselves apart. And at the end of the day, it's it's a little bit around. Establishing, establishing your competitive advantage. So let me take you through some of the slides that, that Paul had for us and um, really talk a bit about how we might find ways to really identify ourselves as specialists. And in, in, one note that Paul made with us when we were setting this webcast up with him, and the reason actually, frankly, that he wrote the book is that in an ever-growing marketplace, whether that be uh, virtual or 
um, uh, geographical or whatever it may be, that there is a growing and compelling business case for finding ways to set yourselves apart from your customers. And while that seems to be pretty much common knowledge and common sense, what we find is that there are a lot of businesses when they're launching, and frankly, even after they've launched, really haven't thought clearly about how to establish themselves uh, as, as a competitive uh, difference in the marketplace. In fact, I'll, I'll segue for one second. One of our courses that we offer is Growth Venture. And Growth Venture is for existing entrepreneurs that have had some success in business. And when we talk with the, the entrepreneurs in, that, in those courses, we ask them, you know, what is, what is your three-year plan? What is your strategic vision for your company? And frankly, a, a lot of times what we get back is, is a look that, that tells us they really haven't spent the time to identify not only just a strategy, but once that strategy is there, how they might um, find a piece of the market and set themselves apart and really, and really grab a competitive share. So Paul's point really is the people and the businesses that really succeed are those that find a way to carve out a specific part of the market, find a way to become really talented and good in that market, and then really own it. So the, the, the reality is there's a lot of competitors out there, and frankly, they, they all are after your business. It is an increasingly competitive business climate, and that's a good thing from our standpoint. Uh, if we're simply looking at the economics of things, we're happy uh, to see that business is growing, but that also means for those of us in business that competition is growing as well. All right, I want to make sure I don't have any questions. It looks like I did. Okay. Um, next slide, I'm going to go on and talk just a little bit about uh, how, to, how to really make yourself, as, as Paul puts it, uh, EBAR. You know, how do you make yourselves that one that everybody else wants to go after, whether you're the, the Google or the Microsoft or the Facebook or even... Uh, so some of your more local entrepreneurs, the, the, the key point here is that specialization makes opening doors a lot easier from a business perspective, and it also helps you foster your listening skills as it, as it pertains to working with business prospects. So how do we become that specific one? And we know that the point is, is that when you're a specialist, selling is is frankly just an easier an easier endeavor all around because you're a specialist and because you've got your competitive edge. And that's what really establishes you, um, in this case, as, as the alpha dog. All right? So the question comes back to, for you as a business owner, and, and I will tell you, there are several, uh, well over 100 of you on this call. And for each of you, the question really is, how do you find a way to establish your, yourself uh, as, that, as that specialist, going from a, a generalist to a specialist? And I think the real important point here, and in fact, if you're taking notes, I'd jot this down. You know, it's, it's not an overnight, necessarily an overnight transition. It is a transition that is, to the point I made earlier, a little bit of a strategic endeavor. So if I'm thinking today, how do I set myself apart from my from my my competition in the marketplace, who are my competitors, and how can I make myself um, and my business, frankly, be one that's, that's going to be viewed as, as the, the gold standard, what I may want to be looking at is establishing, establishing a, a plan, a, a set of goals, if you will, and nothing is as simple as just simply goals, but over the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and maybe even year, and up to three years, what, what sorts of things am I going to do to position my business as a specialist? Does that mean I need to acquire new skill sets? Do I need to enter different, maybe different industries, different markets? Uh, what do I need to do in terms of, of getting perhaps more um, talent on my team? It could be a variety of things, and in fact, it's, it's strictly up to 
your imagination as to how how you define your your path toward becoming the St. Bernard in your industry. Again, let me pause because I do believe I have a question here. Uh, so the question is, what what is Evar? And uh, Paul, Paul, his car is fixed, and we're, he'll be here shortly, and what we'll do is we'll engage him in some questions. But Evar is the name that he's given to his St. Bernard. So I'll let, him, <laughs> I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. Excellent. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit. Again, I want to, I, I, now that we know that Paul will be here, I'll let him elaborate a bit on this. But what is kind of the case? For specialization and, and again he'll go into more detail with this but frankly I think that there's uh, it, there's a, a at least 12 reasons for you to become um, a, a specialist if you will number one generalists struggle they are in a pool of uh, a, a larger pool with many many other uh, entities doing the same things and frankly in today's market buyers really do prefer specialists the perception is that they're getting a higher quality service a higher quality product more knowledge and so oftentimes when we're looking at consumer buying and whether that's uh, from a b2b a business to business or business to consumer what we see and what Paul advocates is that Specialists are more successful because in the mind of the buyer or the customer, they are getting a, a higher value for, for their dollar. So generalists do tend to, to struggle with those very sorts of things. So with the St. Bernard principle, it is really all about kind of finding a way to stand out and, and, and st separate yourself as a generalist. So being a generalist, what we know, it's very costly and it's a very ineffective way to utilize your selling time and your selling dollars. And for you as an entrepreneur, finding a way to maximize your investment is really key. There are a lot of things that are vying for your investment dollar attention, if you will. So again, using that in the, uh, in the most successful way possible is, is helpful to you as the entrepreneur. So again, in his world, what are those block boys talking about? And I'll let him talk to this. Well, and, and I think that's has to do. You know, he he references um, he references H and R Block, and you know, in the early days of H and R Block, that's one of our our homegrown Kansas City companies. That you know, it was two two brothers who thought that they might be able to make some money if they focused strictly on taxes. And so, you know, when it comes to did that make sense? Was that something that was feasible for them to do? Clearly it has been. This is a company that is known at least across the nation, and they've been enormously successful focusing in on the thing that they believe they're best at. So they've carved that niche, and it's turned out to be a quite successful niche. Uh, the same is true for, for FedEx. Um, when FedEx was at least when FedEx was first uh, for, first started, it, it seemed to be something that a lot of people felt probably maybe wouldn't have uh, potential for the success that they actually have had. And so with FedEx, they found a way to become very specific and win market share that, frankly, um, for a lot of people, really hadn't even looked at, at at a large potential for being there. That's right. And when when Fred Smith started this company. He, he really, um, he thought, you know, there must be a way that we can, we can make overnight delivery or express delivery, as it's termed, um, as efficient and effective as possible. And he realized that people would be willing to pay for that. That was a service they were not getting from the other carriers that were then available. So, so let me pause here and just ask you to think about, in your particular industry, Oftentimes, and I hate to use a completely overused phrase, but it, it seems to be fitting, really it's becoming a St. Bernard, becoming a specialist is really reframing reality and looking uh, kind of for those sorts of solutions to problems that are uh, maybe unheard of and doing things 
a different way. And it may not be radically different, but it's enough different that it sets you apart or sets the business apart from the competitors. What we see at Fast Track is the entrepreneurs that are most successful today, yes, they are using maybe different means and methods of communicating with their customers, but they are making it very easy to do business with them. They are, they are satisfying a very direct need, and they're doing so in a way that defies, kind of defies common thinking or, or standard thinking. And, and just that shift of it is enough to really differentiate them. So for, this, for the sake of this webinar, one of the things that we would like to urge you to do, and if, if you're an entrepreneur, do this. If you're, if you're one of our uh, team of partners that we work with, facilitators or program directors, encouraging our entrepreneurs to really look at business opportunity today differently than maybe they did even a year ago. Because the world is changing at an extremely rapid pace, which obviously we all know. But the really cool thing is that with that rapid pace comes a host of new opportunities that, that really are, are yet to be tapped from an entrepreneurial perspective. All right. So Paul talks about something called pooch factors, which are, are those that are, are here. You know, the pooch factors are those that, that really uh, kind of pooch in his world. Actually, I, I'm going to defer to him because he's just walking in. So if you don't mind, let's hold for just a moment. And uh, I will transition the mic to Paul. Okay. Well, um, again, it's my, it's my pleasure to welcome Paul Welch this morning. Unfortunately, due to car trouble and our weather here in Kansas City is not the best today, um, Paul is just now joining us. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> no, no. This um, is my uh, top professional embarrassment no, in my no, life, we're but good. we'll we're make good. up for it. We have... We have um, over a hundred fast track uh, members of our community joining us this morning, and so we've we've gone through many of the slides, and since Michelle and I both are very familiar with the book, and so we've talked through a little bit, uh, kind of what we read from the book, okay. the, the what we what we gained from it. But here we are on, on the pooch factors, and we thought that we'd let you kind of pick up where we left off. Okay, and you set up the beginning of the yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, well, hello everybody. Uh, Ivar and I are eager to share this information with you. Uh, what you're looking at, the pooch factors, or Evar's uh, ideas, uh, why specialists win in business. So P, psychological leverage. O, open doors. O, outflank competition. C, cost effective marketing. And H, home and away opportunities. Okay, let's just take them one at a time. Let's see, where's our slides here? Right, right, right. Yep. Here we go. Okay, uh, so cognitive psychologists will tell you that human beings can't hold two conflicting beliefs at the same time. That's the principle of cognitive dissonance. So if you believe the Beatles were the best rock combo ever, uh, that, then your mind won't change and let you believe it's the Rolling Stones, and vice versa. So if a European trader believes St. Bernard's Crossing the Alps LLC is the best choice for safe passage, then they won't choose an Alaskan Husky, even though the Husky promises to deliver them in a sled. A second psychological principle is, is that of confirmation bias. That's a tendency to confirm what we believe and discount what we don't. So if we believe Japanese cars are more dependable than American cars, we'll notice the Ford Escape broken down on the side of the road, but totally ignore the Honda Accord that just been towed a mile back. In the same way, once you believe you are selling points, competitors have little chance of changing their mind. So there are many psychological reasons that buyers prefer a specialist, but let me just stop there. Simply put, cognitive psychology favors specialists. So let's move to the second pooch factor, opening doors. If you're like most people, you have favorite suppliers, uh, an accountant, a caterer, a banker, a financial planner. Of course, every other accountant, caterer, banker, and financial planner is trying to get their business. And if you're happy with your current suppliers, talking to those others seems like pretty much a waste of time. But since you're a nice person, 
you allow a few of them the courtesy call. But not everyone, because you just don't have the time. None of us have the time. So the ones you see are long shots to get your business, and a lot of others don't even get a chance to present to you. The ones who do get appointments are those who can differentiate themselves. Specialization is a terrific way to differentiate. Specialization opens doors. And the reason is that we're wired to think that a specialist might, might know more than a generalist about the specialty that they're in. So specialists are more likely to get the appointments. And then there's another even bigger plus. Uh, prospects are better listeners when they're speaking to specialists. So how do I know that? Well, my clients who have moved from generalist to specialist tell me that's the case. They say people just listen better and want to know more. So specialization makes opening doors easier and improves the listening skills of prospects. Let's see the next slide. Okay, so outflank is the key word in the second O in pooch factors. And the best way to demonstrate that this point is through a true story that I have. Several years ago, a healthcare client of mine asked if I could help them in their search for an advertising agency. We developed a request for proposal that was sent to 26 agencies. Three declined, but three submitted the paperwork. 23 submitted the paperwork. My client had five members on the search committee, and I asked each of them to select and rank their top three after reviewing the RFPs. Out of 23 agencies, one appeared on all five ballots, and only one. Why was that? It was because they specialized in health care. They immediately went to the short list, got to the final three ad agencies strictly because they specialized. So selling is simply easier uh, when you're a specialist. In fact, Eva will tell you that it's fun being the alpha dog. So I have to, I have to stop you there. Uh, several of our listeners have asked, who is Evar? Michelle and I did a miserable uh, job of explaining who Evar is. Can you talk well, about Ivar, how he got his name and everything? Well, actually, Evar, I had a, an uncle, Evar, and uh, he looked so much like my uncle, Evar, that I, <laughs> I resisted it for a long time. But he ran a Swedish grocery store. <laughs> Well, so and he was a specialist in, uh, in the grocery industry, he, huh? He actually, what he did, you know, all the, and it's a real good example that a lot of times the, uh, you know, had all the little neighborhood supermarkets that one by one went away. Well, my uncle started, uh, you know, he had a Scandinavian background, so he started stocking Scandinavian specialty food. Nice. Perfect. And even at Christmas time, uh, if, you're, if you're Scandinavian, loot fist is like your turkey. And so he actually brought in root fisk, lingonberries, mm -hmm. which are their equivalent mm -hmm. of cranberries. Mm -hmm. And he did a very much, and then he added some barbecue later. But, but basically, he was able to keep a small neighborhood grocery store open because he was a specialist. That's wonderful. Good question. That's great. Um, so um, anyway, so we developed that request for, well, what I was saying is so, you can really, uh, selling is easier when you're a specialist, and, and you can actually get down to the finals without doing anything more than being a specialist. So then, uh, let's see the next slide here. Okay, so the C in Pooch Factors is cost-effective marketing. It's incredible how much more cost-effective a specialist can be compared with a generalist. The best way I've found to demonstrate that is through the new business balance wheel, which we'll put up now. Um, this is a self-evaluation tool that we developed for marketers, but today I just want to use it to explain why marketing is more cost-effective for specialists than generalists. The balance wheel includes eight spokes, and if we begin at the top, uh, the 12 o'clock spoke, that one's labeled positioning. If you, well, if you can't read it, that is the positioning spoke. Now, plenty of companies position themselves without specializing, and I realize that. For example, Walmart for low prices or Hallmark for high quality. But for this exercise, I just simply want to use the balance wheel to demonstrate why marketing is much more cost-effective for generalists. But before I go on, I have to emphasize that it's extremely important to identify a position for your business. You need to be able to articulate why someone should do business with you. Unfortunately, many businesses don't take the time to do that. They, 
They'd rather go straight to branding. That seems so popular. But here's the reality. Branding is little more than a graphic art program if it doesn't reflect a well-conceived position. So that being said, let's get back to why it's more expensive to be a generalist. A generalist position goes something like this. We can do anything for anybody at any time. And that's not much of an exaggeration. I've been there before, I can tell you. In a generalist mind, everybody is a prospect. Let's, uh, I'm going to use an arch architect here for an example, just so you can kind of envision a little better. The generalist architect says, we do both architectural design and design build in areas of historic preservation, individual residences, multi-unit residential, dormitories, strip shopping centers, office buildings, manufacturing facilities, banks, giant box stores, and hospital operating suites. Now there's a mouthful. Uh, the specialist architect says, we specialize in the design of hospital operating suites. Bingo, that's it. With everything the generalist is trying to sell, his elevator speech couldn't be completed on a trip to the top of the Sears Tower. On the other hand, the specialist can get her position across on a trip from the first to the second floor. Well, if you've ever spent any time at a seminar to learn how to develop a good elevator speech, which I've done in the past, you're probably a generalist because you wouldn't need that seminar if you were a specialist. So let's move to the second spoke entitled Prospect Identification. If you could back up oh, to sorry. not quite to, yeah, sorry. that's good. Just stay on the, uh, oh, that, stay on the, uh, yep. the wheel for a while. So the second spoke there is Prospect Identification. The generalist puts together all the people who might be prospects for its laundry list of offerings. It requires millions of pieces of data and takes forever to compile. It includes every homeowner and every business owner because they view just about everybody as their prospect. After all, just about everyone in the free world is a prospect for this generalist architect. And the generalist actually believes it's a good thing to have so many potential clients. I think that's a problem that we all fall into. We think the more clients, the better, and not necessarily so. The specialist, however, has a much shorter list. It consists, in the case we used here, of hospitals and ambulatory care centers that utilize operating suites, and maybe a few th third-party influencers, but that's about it. It's a much easier to compile because it's targeted to their specialty. Now, the third spoke there on the right at 3 o'clock uh, that's prospect list management. So in, in uh, spoke two, we developed our list. Now we've got to manage it. Uh, the specialist list is a few hundred names. The generalist list is a few million. If they both wanted to make a mailing, the specialist could do it very affordably. For the same budget as the generalist, they could send something really impressive, really special to their prospects, anything from lumpy mailers to even gifts. But when the generalist decides to make a mailing, even, even sending a simple letter would be impractical given the size of that prospect list. It would literally be a budget buster for most companies. So in the end, they cut way back on the list who they're going to mail to. They leave a lot of those prospects that develop totally out, or frequently just do nothing at all out of frustration or not knowing who to mail to. So simply put, the list is just too big and too expensive to manage if you're a generalist. The next spoke, self-promotion, is what I use to describe things like networking. So imagine yourself as that generalist. You need to join a dozen associations to cover all the industry you want to sell to. Uh, joining and attending meetings and conventions gets expensive, especially if you want to exhibit in any of those. The specialist simply joins medical associations. It's easier and cheaper for them to network. They can afford to exhibit. And the association members, their prime prospects, get to know them. So when it comes time to find an architect for an operating suite, the hospital is familiar with the specialist, but the generalist is a stranger. And that's a bad place to start a sales call. I think you would all agree. So let's do one more spoke. This one sells promotion, your website, brochures, and other marketing materials. When you go to the generalist architect's website, the message will be very general and very ineffective because they have too many things to talk about. So they simply talk about themselves. 
that's an even bigger problem when you're not talking about when you're talking about yourselves and not the customer. That is not a good formula for selling. And it would be far too expensive to have separate website and collateral material for every type of prospect in multiple industries. In the case that I gave you that healthcare company looking for an ad agency, the one ad agency that ended up making the finals, they already had all that material done. They didn't have to develop anything. They didn't have to make anything new. So one site, one website is just fine for a specialist because they're just providing a lot of detail and that information is rel relative to their target prospects. Okay, the other spokes on the wheels you look there, I'm not going to go into all of them, but they depend on what kind of business you're in, whether you're a service business or a manufacturer, retailer, or whatever. But the economic differences continue to exist as you go through that, whatever your industry is. Now, I have an architect client who actually developed a specialist business model just like the one I described in that example. He went from a generalist with an okay business to a specialist in designing operating suites. What's amazing to me is they now write the architectural specifications for operating rooms nationally. Now, can you imagine what a competitive advantage it would be for you if you were writing the specs for your industry? The fi final pooch factor is home and away opportunities. Okay, let me use a different architect example, not that I just do business with architects, but this one's too good to pass up. Uh, so to demonstrate our age here. Now, all I grew up in Missouri, my career moved me to the East Coast twice, in New Jersey and Connecticut. And most natives of those two states that I met just viewed the Midwest as flyover country. They could never accept that there was one thing in Missouri that was on a par with anything on the East Coast. For the most part, they wouldn't under, couldn't understand why anybody would even live in the Midwest except to raise livestock. <laughs> okay, so with that mindset as a backdrop, when New York decided to redo Yankee Stadium, they needed to find an architect. Certainly, there are an abundance of good architects on the East Coast, but with the face of baseball's most storied franchise in the balance, they chose a Kansas City, Missouri firm to do the work. Now that's pretty surprising, isn't it, based on the, the background we talked about. The firm was populous, and they were chosen because they're specialists in stadiums and arena. As I said before, and Ivar says, people want to buy from specialists. And it's not like Yankee ownership is any unique in that regard, because Populous also designed baseball stadiums for the New York Mets, Baltimore Orioles, Chicago White Sox, Cleveland Indians, Minnesota Twins, San Francisco Giants, St. Louis Cardinals, and more. All those cities have great architects, but they were not specialists in stadiums. So the folks came to Kansas City. And by the way, by specializing, Populous is the largest architectural firm in Kansas City doing nothing but stadiums and arenas. They're a purebred St. Bernard all the way. So here's the bottom line. As Ivor says, if you want to open your geographic opportunities, your paw print will be bigger as a St. Bernard. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so the arguments for specialization are so compelling that if you're a generalist, I'm sure you just rush out of this webinar and rush home and change your business model. Uh, but I'll own up. I don't think that's going to happen to many of you. And the reason is, a couple of reasons, but one is it just change, changes hard. And besides, everything that Eva and I have told you so far is really counterintuitive. Intuition suggests the more things you have to sell, the more you'll be able to sell. Uh, um, see, go yeah, no, we'll go ahead. Next slide, please. And then we'll, we'll go to some questions here at the end. Okay. You want me to kind of rush through here? Oh, no, no. Okay. No. Um, well, let me ask a question, yeah, actually, sure. because I think it goes before you go too far. One of the questions we have is, what do you do when several of your competitors are also specialists? Well, frankly, very few are, because it really takes a lot of guts to do it. Uh, if you get in, then at least you're on an e equal playing field with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're a generalist, you're not. So it doesn't happen very often, but but when it does, at least you you can enlist your other selling techniques. And uh, 
And one thing that I found with some of my clients too is they they you know if we have time I'll get into it later. But folks who change from a generalist model of uh, direct marketing and fundraising they they move to a specialist model just doing uh, just doing monthly giving programs mm -hmm. and. As they go out and call on people, they find out, they think, oh, we really narrowed it down now. We're, we're just doing monthly giving programs. Mm -hmm. But then they'll get out and they'll call like on a university uh, foundation, and they say, you ever have, it, do I have an experience? Are you a specialist in university foundations? So really what you want to do is you drill down as far, and we'll get, get to it a little bit, and show you still have to have the economic model. Right, right. But, how, but you drill down as far as you can why that economic model is still valid. Well, and I think it sort of begs the next question. Another, another listener has asked, how early in the process should you, begin the, should you begin to become a specialist? Well, if you're a startup business, I think you should do it right, right away. I mean, there's no, you know, you're, you've got a blank piece of paper there. You're designing what your business will look, at, look like. Um, and I just, I just had a, uh, a meeting yesterday with somebody who every time we talked about it she had a great idea of the business and it was really valid but she kept saying well what if that doesn't work and, and kept wanting to slide back but so was it like was it a fear factor that, yeah yeah so it was sort of the the fear of if i specialize will i be kept out of the market yeah, yeah that my market's going to be too small yeah and i'll um I, I talk about in here a few slides later uh, about I think most people probably online have read Good to Great yeah. and um, the Hedgehog uh, yeah. concept. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you want to ship that, we can go right there. We're pretty flexible. If you okay. move a few slides ahead, we can sure. get into. Did I go backwards? Oh, here there, we go. Yeah, Sorry. Fine. There, we go. Uh, no, there no, no. right there. Yeah. So, um, okay, so. Anyway, great book, good to great. If you haven't read Jim Collins, and they have, the, if you know what the hedge, con, hedge uh, concept of, you, if you read it, but if you don't, let me give you this quick Cliff Notes version. And what they do is they use overlapping circles to sum up the hedgehog concept. And a basically, the story of hedgehog concept is the fox is much smarter and faster and quicker and and ferocious than the hedgehog, but the hedgehog does one thing very well, better than anybody rolls up in little balls so the fox can't get at him. Okay. So that's the one thing. So we're trying so the hedgehog concept here is what are you passionate about? That's number one. Get do something you're really passionate about. Number two, what can you be the world's best at? Now I think you know that's the ultimate the world's best. Who knows what your world's best, but maybe you're the market's best mm -hmm. or, or maybe the United States best or whatever. <coughs> and uh, and so what can you be the best in the world at? Um, I'm going to I'm going to give you this little case study here because I think it'll be better. Uh, I was speaking at an American Marketing Association workshop on positioning, and when we, it was a general positioning seminar, and when we got to the, the possibility of doing positioning as a specialist, I had a guy raise his hand, and he was a he was a home remodeler, and he said, "I do kitchens and decks and baths and rec rooms and and all this stuff," and uh, and I think if I just did one thing, I'd, I'd go broke. So I asked him at that time, I said, well, what do you really like to do? And he said, well, I'm really passionate about kitchens. Mm. Uh, so there it is, the, 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 the hedgehog concept, the passion, the first one. And I said, well, are you any good at that? And he said, yeah. He said, we're really good. He said, we won a bunch of awards for our kitchen design. And so, you know, world's best or the market's best or what do you want to say? He was two out of three. And and the third one is the economic engine, and it's yeah. could I make enough money by specializing mm -hmm. to walk away from the other stuff? So Does that make sense? It makes sense. But one uh, so one of our listeners has a really good question because and it speaks to what you're talking about. I think a lot of people when they start, they haven't learned or thought about this concept of specialization versus being a generalist. And I think a lot of people enter the market as generalists because of the ec the economics. You know, it appears that yeah. there's a bigger piece of the pie. They're brand new entrepreneurs, and there's a bit of a taking a leap kind of thing. Yeah. So the the question from one of our participants is, how do you tr now that you know this, how do you transition from being 
a, a generalist to a specialist, and what does that journey look like? Okay, well, there's kind of two questions here. One is when I start business. And when I start business, I'm going to say, okay, what's in the case of this uh, home remodeler, for example, uh, Harvard University puts out data on how much volume, sales volume there is in a market. So you can actually go in, in, in a lot of industries, you can actually go in and find out, okay, what is, what is the total pie? Okay, and then once you know the total pie, you say, well, what's a reasonable market share that I think I could get out of that? And let me tell you, you're going to have a bigger market share as a specialist than you are as a generalist. You're going to have fewer competitors. You're going to win more uh, sales. You're going to do all that as a specialist. So you drill down and say, okay. And so what he has to do is look and say, well, would kitchens uh, be enough for me? And in fact, if we can go to the next slide, I'll show you my elementary school uh, analysis of that. Okay, I'm going to say, what if there was uh, a million dollars in in kitchen sales in a market in any year, and there were 100 generalist contractors. All things being equal, each of them would do about a million dollars in it. But what if what if one of those uh, 100 was a specialist? And from what we've talked about and what I've seen, people would rather deal with a specialist. I get that every day. It's amazing how many people who are negative about it, they think about it and say, that's the way I buy it. Uh, a friend of mine the other day, he said he had been denouncing the whole idea of specialization, and he said, called me up, and he said, Paul, I was going to do a stone patio for my backyard, and I got a magazine that had all kinds of suppliers, and he says, I'm not looking at anybody that doesn't say they specialize in stone patios, <laughs> and he was totally against the whole idea of specialization, and then he starts realizing, you all will see it in your everyday life as you look, as you go through, as you walk out of wherever you're at today, you'll see what I'm talking about everywhere. So it's almost like it's the vernacular that frightens people. Yeah. It's it's this notion that somehow they're limiting themselves yeah. as opposed to expanding the pie by becoming a specialist. Right. Yeah. That's a great point. And we skip we skip the thing we skipped over there. I met a guy at a, a a breakfast seminar and he is the largest you don't have to go back to it, I'll just talk about it. Okay. But but he he uh, sells baseball bats and gloves. That's all he sells and he's got He's the largest seller, online seller of baseball bats and gloves, the largest anywhere. And people say, well, gee, why don't you sell basketballs and why don't you sell uniforms and cheerleading outfits and all? Because you have, look, if you had all these things to sell, how much more you could sell? And I asked him, I said, what do you tell? Because what he did, he even breaks it down. He has a website for, for baseball bats and he has a website for baseball gloves. Oh, it's interesting. Another one of our, our listeners asked, could you create different models and market them separately? So in a way, that's what he's done. He's here's my specialty site mm -hmm. for bats. Here's my specialty site for balls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, he, and what he tells him, he said, look, he says, I'm not even touching the market share for bat, bats and gloves. He, yeah. says, he says, I'm a I'm leader, and I haven't even touched my potential. He, says, he told me, so why do I want to dilute my efforts? So when you think back to that third circle uh, in the hedgehog thing, you first analyze what is the market. I mean, you you don't want to be the whole market. It's like that architect with a million prospects. You don't need a million prospects. How many prospects do you need to be effective? Because you'll be more effective at a special as a specialist. Um, so there's another question. I, do you mind if we just jump in with no, it? That's I think fine. It kind of yeah, I, yeah, I'm at, at your beck and call here. Okay. So the question is, wouldn't specialization create a balancing act in obtaining market share of my respective industry? So, for example, personal coaching, specializing in um, business protocol versus sports protocol, and the, the – uh, uh, participant says that they diversify in this arena with a number of topics relative to sports, etiquette, etc. I think maybe uh, some that uh, that I honestly that I found because it's real scary to think about being a specialist. I don't discount that, even though we can go through and if you look at the data and look at everything, you say that's what I need to be. Um, but if if um, one of the things that we have in the book, the, there's a ranking deal in the last chapter, and the, the first one is purebred St. Bernard. It's that, that architect that does nothing but stadiums. But the second thing is, is I think perhaps if I was going to write another book, I think it would be on the litter twin 
con strategy. <laughs> and what the litter twin, it, there is in the dog world, there is such a thing as litter twin, but the only way you know is if, if you do a DNA test or you happen to be at their birth and see they're in the same sack. But trainers then, if they know they have litter twins, they will separate them after weaning to train them because they get in the way of each other. And that's why I call this one. So this is a more safe way to, to do what we're talking about. So you leave your own business intact. Do it the way you've always been doing it. And then you, then you move to a litter twin. You pull out something, one piece of that business, you know, if it could have been, uh, well, uh, could have been baseball gloves initially. You know, he pulled out baseball gloves out, still had his overall company that sold a lot of things, but he pulled out basic ball gloves, had its own website, its own budget, its own selling points and everything. And, and I think that that is the less scary, not real expensive to do. You've got to create a different website. You've got to do some different materials, but not super expensive. And it can be very powerful. And I have, I don't know, I'll have time to get in it, but a case study I, I was going to give is, uh, is that uh, direct marketer. And they now, they, they left their one company intact that was a generalist. They brought, it, brought out the, uh, um, the engaged giving, the monthly engaged giving part, and made a different company, and now they don't even mess with litter. They, they let the momentum carry that business as long as it could. They were getting had existing customers and referrals to the the generalist business, but now they don't even touch it. <laughs> I think they've closed <laughs> it down because they're doing so well, uh, specializing just in, in monthly engaged giving. So their journey then actually they took a safe route in a way. They did because they they kept their one business intact and they they set up their specialized and they just let let the path go as it did. Yeah, they let the path go. And and what I told them, I said, now put all of your sales and marketing efforts against the specialist company, you know, because that's where you're going to see the returns. Mm -hmm. But that or you're still going to have some business out here. But I actually tried when I was doing looking up the website. I, I can't even find their website for the old company. I wasn't aware they've closed it down, but I think they have. Uh, but, but they're doing... Uh, you know, and they're doing work back into uh, broaden your geographic reach. Uh, they're doing work in North Carolina and Wyoming and Colorado and Texas and Kansas and Missouri uh, because when they they call, you know, there's plenty of fundraising companies and there's there's plenty of uh, direct marketing companies, but they're calling all over the country saying we specialize in monthly engaged giving. And they get the people want to see them. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And so, in this, what we have up there now, that specialist five million. I think that's very possible if they did nothing but kitchens and went to the kitchen shows. And and the the psychology that comes in there, we all think if they do nothing but kitchens, that they probably have uh, better sources. They they get better pricing. They know more about specialty materials. Friends. Whether they do or not, that's the way we view it as consumers. We just think specialists are going to know more than the general. They're experts. They're experts. Exactly. Uh, so it, just like we said, it's all about sales and marketing. When you go in, once you select that, whether you go a purebred St. Bernard or you go uh, the litter twin way, the sales and marketing all need to emphasize that specialty. You can go in there. Or any other questions too, and we're getting into the letters. So I, this is what I was talking about. These people wanted just to give you a little on that case study, though. And we, in fact, if you have questions, we can go to them. Yeah. So we do have another question, which is a really good one. Does the market drive uh, where you specialize, or your capability drive where you specialize? Uh, where you start? Well, you you first of all have to have that third circle there. You have to. There has to be enough volume in that particular segment that you can make money there. So yeah. It can't be too narrow. But um, if you go back to the other two circles, the passionate thing probably 
you have expertise in something because you developed a passion or you're passionate because you have expertise. I don't know, yeah. you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. But <laughs> so do you think that if you identify that, this is my question, if you identify a, a niche in the market and you say, I can see that this is underserved, I can see there's an opportunity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seize this part of it. It's not really my passion, but I can see the economic model. Mm -hmm. Is is that still so it's efficient, really? Yeah. Yeah, that that would still work because I, the good to great book I would just give in their scenario, but my St. Bernard scenario would be yeah, you're just looking at it as a market opportunity, and yeah. certainly you don't want to do something that you just hate doing, but. If you don't mind it and you can make money at it, that's a pretty good solution too. <laughs> that usually drives some passion, <laughs> I think. Paul, we have we have time for uh, maybe one more question. I know you probably have a couple of wrap up slides, but what, one of the questions that came in um, even prior to the webinar, somebody submitted it. They, they, it's a person who's a consultant, and she says, in consulting, what is the relative importance of a specialist credentials? Uh, versus basically credentials and expertise versus having tools and methodologies to promote or to market. So you talked about it being all about marketing. She she says that she's thinking of this um, specifically related to, related to the new business development process. She says that her business does strategic coaching and change leadership work with a focus on developing successful women leaders. So I guess the question is, does she need to have kind of that street cred um, and or is it really the tools and the products and services that she has to offer or is it a combination? Well, it's, it can be a combination, certainly, but I think what you look at it when you say, uh, you know, I'm going to do uh, women business consulting, I mean, that's a pretty big area. What if I said I'm only going to consult with women retailers or mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, you know, how can you drill that down further? And then you drill it down as far as you can where you still have a market opportunity. So yeah, so only executive leaders or only only women in engineering yeah. or something like that. So you get even you keep specializing or you keep kind of getting as close to a, a, a particular expertise as possible. Exactly, because once again, people want to deal for specialists. I, I I wasn't going to use this example, but actually the guy with the paver brick. He's a yeah. client of mine, and I, the first day I went in to do work for him. He said, I know you got the book and I don't want to hear about it. He says, when I have time, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about why specialization will work when, you know, when you have time. But we don't have time now. We didn't get into my stuff. And, and in that very meeting, he, and he does, he's a executive, retained executive search consultant. And he does a lot of work at hospitals and, and uh, banks and industry. And then a lot of other stuff. He'll do anything that comes in. So he's not I kid, you're going to screw around, you're going to mess me up here. But in that same conversation, he told me, uh, well, yeah, I was over at a hospital the other day, and the hospital said, uh, do you have any expertise in pulmonary? You know, so, and he just kind of blew it off. And then I'm in his office the next time. He says, Paul, he said, I thought I had this hospital client lined up, but they ended up going to Houston. For you know, And I said, well, he says, can you help me? And I said, well, what did they go to Houston for? He said, well, Houston firm had a specialist in hospitals. <laughs> I said, I can't help you. <laughs> I said, you, you can't compete with a specialist. Right. You know, so That's great. That's great. So he sort of, he helped you prove your point. Well, people do. As yeah. The more they talk. I, if I go out to a lunch, halfway through the lunch, they start selling me on why it's right. But it's still scary. And, yeah. and that's why something like the Litter Twin, if you approach it that way, then you can keep your intact just to have your security blanket. But you're going to be more successful in the offshoot specialist, and you can decide whether you're going to close down. The That's great. Yeah. So, so we have only about three more minutes. Um, maybe why don't we skip to the end? And uh, I know you have kind of a wrap-up slide, but any any kind of final advice that uh, you want to share with the with the audience here? Well, I think the biggest thing is that you just have to one lose your skepticism that this will work. Mm -hmm. Just try to be open-minded enough to say. Well, what if this guy that comes late to webinars actually knows what he's talking about? <laughs> you know, and and so think of it that way. And then, um, just like that meeting I was on yesterday, the lady figured out her specialty, but then she kept backing off from it. And I say, don't back off, drill down further. You know, could you drill down further? And uh, you know, she was talking about senior living communities, and and then she thought, well, outstate or independence or what? You know, so. Yeah. And, and she still had plenty of money to operate. If she's successful in that segment, she was going to operate. So 
every time you think about pulling out, think the opposite of, of how you might drill down. That's great. And lose your skepticism. The, the skeptic, of course, the, the definition of the person knows uh, the price of everything and the value of nothing, you know. So, <laughs> so. Oh, that's great. Well, Paul, thank you so much. You know, what I would say is that um, you came in actually exactly when you should have, because I don't think Michelle and I could have gone to the level of specialty that you did when we got to the pooch factors. So we're, we're so grateful for your time today. And as, as our listening audience knows, we always think it's extra special when we can invite our author into what we call our studio here at Kaufman Fast Track. So, Paul, thank you. Um, for those of you in the audience, thank you so much for joining us again today. Um, as always, this uh, recording will be available. We hope by the end of the week we will, of course, send you a notice um, of its availability so you can have it for replay. The slides will also be made available at fasttrack.org slash authors. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Again, that will be on May 22nd featuring Bob Hisrich, the Professor of Entrepreneurship at Thunderbird School of Global Management. He'll be talking about his book, Corporate Entrepreneurship, How to Create a Thriving Entrepreneurial Spirit Throughout Your Company. Thank you all for your time and attention. We look forward to talking with you again soon.